<laughs> Peter's now, look, we know you're a huge Arsenal fan. Um, yeah. Now, a video was sent out the other day from TalkSport about me talking about Gabriel Jesus and the signing. That's taken a little bit out of context, but I stand by what I said, really, in terms of I think it's a good signing for Arsenal, but not outstanding. I don't think he's the messiah that's going to get you back to where you want well, to be. I, I, what what I, do you I, think? I, I the, well, I watched what you said, and yeah. I thought it was fair enough. I, I, I didn't dispute it. I think the truth is we are not at the moment in a, in a place where we're going to sign the elite strikers of the world. Mm. You're not going to get an Mbappé and Haaland coming to a club with no Champions League football. So you have to accept that the very top tier, you know, those guys and Lewandowski and the others, they're not going to come to a club like Arsenal. So then the question becomes, well, of the second tier strikers in the world who've got pretty good records, who are mm. playing for the national team, you know, I mean, Jesus, for example, has scored, I think, 19 goals in 50-odd games for Brazil's yeah. national team. That's good enough for me. That means he's a very, very good striker who's played over 50 games for Brazil and banged in a lot of goals. And I think that if Guardiola thinks he's a good player, he's a good player. Uh, he's not absolutely top draw, outstanding, but could he get 20 goals a season for us? Absolutely. Is he a better option than Lacazette, who hasn't scored in open play since December the 16th, let me remind you? Yes, absolutely. Uh, do I still feel furious we got rid of Aubameyang? Yes. Mm. Am I even more furious to see the trailers for the Amazon All or Nothing thing come out today, reminding me of what is going to be the football equivalent of a snuff movie? Yes. <laughs> so, um, all things considered, I am pleased we've got a young 25-year-old who's a very experienced international player who scores a lot of goals. I think he's, he's strong, he's quick, he's a team player, he's hardworking, he's tricksy. And I always judge, you know, you can always tell, can't you, how good a player is. How does City fans, have, how have they been reacting? Yeah. They've actually all been queuing up to praise him and say what a hard worker is and what a good player is and the sorry he's going. That, I think all things considered, he's a good signing. Do you think this could halter the progression of Enketier, or do you think he'll learn off Gabriel Jesus? No, I think if you're Enketier, you're like, great, I've got a good young striker who's a bit more experienced than me to help to help me uh, along the way. From what I hear about Jesus, he's very good with young players. Everyone likes him. He's very popular. Uh, and I think he's got a great work ethic. I like players who've got a great work ethic. Mm. And the one thing I would say about Arsenal's players, I don't think it's a lack of work ethic commitment and I think their attitude uh, by comparison say to Man United's young players I think our young players have a much better attitude they're just not collectively good enough yet to compete against the big boys mm. and uh, that's the problem so I think bringing in players like Jesus great I would love us to go and get Rapina from Leeds I think he would be a great signing and I think then you start to think well we've got a chance of being top four but let's be under no illusion we're in a battle for top four it's going to be hard mm. you know we're up against teams like Newcastle heavily funded now Chelsea, the kitchen sink, will be thrown at their, their funding. You're going to see Man United buying everyone that's left over. You know, Tottenham are going to be much stronger. They've got a great coach in Conte. So I'm looking at this going, even top six is going to be a challenge. Mm. So I think Arsenal fans need to have a, a, an expectation which is realistic. Do you think you stay up? No, I'm only joking. Um, I, asked, <laughs> I, I asked this question yesterday. I'll ask you now. What's more important for Arsenal this season? Is it league finishing? So would you rather take fourth and no trophy or eighth in the Europa League? Because uh, Europa League will get you Champions League football, right? Yeah, I, I don't really care about the Europa League. Let me be brutally honest. I really don't. I don't care about the FA Cup very much. I certainly oh, don't care. Piers, that's it's the same league. result. It's the same result, well, Champions no, League, been, but you get a trophy I, at the I end of it. Love I fell in love with Arsenal. If they made the winner of the FA Cup, if they gave them the Champions League last place, I would be in favour of that because I think you would, in a single moment, you would restore the FA Cup back to what it used yeah, to be. Yeah, but then you might, get Wigan. you might get Wigan playing Champions League football. Well, no, you wouldn't because what you'd, what you'd have is all the big boys putting out their best teams again in the FA Cup. Mm. I can't take a competition seriously where most of the big teams put their reserve teams out for most of the mm. earlier rounds. I can't. It's just not to me, it's not what it used to be. When I was young, I fell in love with Arsenal when Charlie George scored that streamer at Wembley in 71. Yeah, and I was double. five and a half years old and I remember thinking, this is fantastic. And the whole FA Cup day on television, you know, was just an amazing event. And every team put up their best teams. They all wanted to win it. It had unbelievable kudos. No one can pretend it's anything like that anymore. It's no. just not. No, uh, it's not. We've won the FA Cup a lot. We've won the FA Cup a lot in recent years. And it's meaningless because we've not been competing for the league or the Champions League or even come close. So, to me, it's realism time for Arsenal. Mm. What do we want to be? A team that thinks winning the FA Cup is a good thing or a team that genuinely wants to compete to get the Champions mm. League and to win the Premier League. It's got to be the last thing. 
OK. Uh, before I let you go, before we talk about your show, just a quick word on cricket. I know you're a massive fan. Owen Morgan announced his international retirement earlier today. Uh, yeah. Where do you rank him amongst England's greats? Oh, absolutely. In terms of one day, the greatest captain we've ever had. I think Owen Morgan, on and off the pitch, a magnificent, towering figure who has transformed our one-day cricket into world beaters, literally. I was there at Lords when we won the World Cup. It was the greatest day of cricket imaginable. And I think Owen Morgan just conducts himself in such a brilliant way, but also he's inspired that team, uh, both in the in the 50-over and the 20-over uh, formats, to play with unbelievable attacking flair and exhilarating dynamism. And we're now seeing that same attitude coming to the test team. Because uh, I honestly have never felt more excited about England cricket than I do right now. Because this, what's been going on against New Zealand, one of the best teams in the world, the way we've dismantled them with just unbelievable attacking cricket, that has been great to watch. But it's all from, I think, Owen Morgan sowing the seeds in one day mm. cricket of what we could do. And so I, I salute him, honestly. He's been one of the, I think, one of the greatest captains we've ever had. And certainly in terms of one day cricket, if you win the World Cup for your country, you are number one yeah. and he, he for me is number one so thank you Owen Morgan ok just one quick word before I let you go of course we talked about your show Piers Morgan Uncensored it's uh, Monday to Thursday from 8pm you always have great guests on it tonight is no exception remind us who you've got coming on well we've got we've got two things that are really interesting one is this fascinating development in the Jill Dando story and I don't know if you boys are even old enough to remember this I am was, sadly this was a huge, it was a huge huge story Jill Dando is like one of the biggest stars on British television and got executed outside her house and it's never been sold. They caught some loner, twisted weirdo. It turned out not to be him. And now this is development as this, this uh, model agency boss who's been uh, through a, a court case involving lots of sexual abuse of young models, one of whom it turned out had been investigating him, not as a model, but had been investigating what he'd been doing. And long story short, he was uh, apparently in a conversation with somebody that was overheard. It's now come out in these court documents during his trial where they said that uh, this blonde presenter who was investigating him, not Jill Dando, had actually uh, should be uh, killed by a mafia hitman who agreed to do it. Now, the word is, and this is just a theory, but the word is this blonde presenter lived very near to Jill Dando. Her doctor was Jill Dando's uh, fiance Alan Farthing, who was a doctor. Uh, so random coincidences, are obviously connected in some weird way. And the question is, did the mafia hitman who was hired to kill the investigative journalist actually kill the wrong presenter? And if that is true, it would solve one of the all-time great mm. mysteries, certainly in my journalism career. So fascinating uh, uh, debate we'll have about that. We've got Nick Ross on tonight, who used to be the co anchor of Crime Watch with Jill Dando. So we're fascinated to see what he thinks of the theory. Um, and we've also got, I don't know if you remember recently, the Google engineer who reckons that he that they've been working on these programs at Google and he thinks they've gone sentient. In other words, artificial intelligence is starting to behave in a way that we can't control. Uh, he got suspended by Google because of it. This is his first British interview. It is fascinating because wow. I interviewed Professor Stephen Hawking recently, before, before he died a couple of years ago, and he said to me, the biggest threat to civilization was if artificial intelligence could self-design. In other words, think for itself. If this Google engineer is right, basically, guys, the clock is ticking before it's all over. Wow. Okay. Some people would say it's already happened if they listen to the Sports Bar at 10. But listen, Piers, <laughs> always a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for coming on. It sounds like Thank another you. powerful, wonderful show, so good luck with that. And good, good luck with the Lego. <laughs> <laughs> he, he needs it. He